Welcome, uh, everyone. Um, we have the pleasure today of having Professor Elena Fidian Krasmitje uh, from University College London. Um, uh, she is the uh, professor in Migration and Refugee Studies at the Geography Department um, in, at UCL in the UK. She's the co-director of the UCL Migration Research Unit and is the founder and director uh, of the Institute of Advanced Studies, Refugee in a Moving World Research, Research Network across UCL. Uh, so, Professor Kazmije, she has um, uh, a vast uh, experience um, uh, focusing um, uh, on um, uh, the study of the refugees uh, and the intersection between gender, generation and religion in context of conflicts induced displacement, with a particular focus on the Middle East and North Africa. Um, she has conducted uh, uh, extensive research in refugee camps and urban areas, including in Algeria, Cuba, Egypt, France, Jordan, Lebanon, South Africa, Syria, Sweden, and the uh, UK. Um, drawing on a critical theoretical perspective, her work contributes to key debates surrounding refugees' experiences of conflict-induced displacement, the nature of refugee donor relation and both north-south and south-south humanitarian resources to forced migration. Her current research uh, examines uh, southern actor responses to displacement from uh, uh, Syria, uh, including responses developed by local host communities and refugees themselves. So let's uh, welcome Professor Fidian Krasmiye. And she will be uh, first giving her presentation and uh, she will be taking uh, questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for your very warm words of welcome and thank you for inviting me. Thanks to all of you for, for joining um, this session. I know that there are many competing demands on your time, so um, I'm very glad to, um, to see so many names in squares um, on, on, on my screen. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking um, on the topic of refugee-led responses to overlapping precarities, um, focusing on a particular refugee camp in North Lebanon. Um, and in so doing, I'll be drawing on um, two articles, um, which um, are themselves based on longstanding research. Um, so these articles were published last year, um, firstly in the Journal of Palestine Studies, which focuses in particular on the evolving situation um, with reference to um, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, from March to June in, um, in Badawi refugee camp in North Lebanon. And the second piece, which is co-authored with Yusuf Mustafa Kasmir, who was himself born in Badawi refugee camp, um, is an article that was published in Current History and focuses in part on the events surrounding the post-Beirut um, blast in August 2020. And again, how, um, how this has affected people who've um, experienced displacement and are responding to overlapping um, crises effectively in their neighborhoods. Um, these um, articles are themselves informed by long-standing research, as, I, as I've mentioned, including two research projects, uh, Refugee Hosts and Southern Responses to Displacement, which I've been leading since 2016 with a team of um, colleagues, researchers in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, um, as well as in Europe. Um, and which have been exploring how people, groups, organizations in the Middle East, amongst other places, have been responding to displacement from Syria since 2011. And as I hope is increasingly recognized um, by now, far from being passive recipients of humanitarian aid, people who have experienced displacement um, are themselves always already finding ways to respond to the challenges that they face um, and also to help others in the same situations. And in those projects, refugee hosts and southern responses to displacement, we start from the premise that the residents of neighbourhoods which are hosting refugees have often experienced displacement and forced migration in the past themselves, and indeed may well face displacement again in the future. 
So this effectively means that people who are currently labelled as refugees were, are and will be hosts. And the ways that histories of displacement intersect with histories of hosting have important implications for both the present and the future. And in my research, this means um, uh, increasing attention to different forms of refugee-refugee relationality, which is a, a term that I use to explore these relationships between people who have um, been, been displaced. Um, and that includes a focus on refugees hosting refugees um, and on a broader range of refugee-led responses to displacement and indeed their responses to more than displacement. And this focus on the more than displacement, I think, is important um, for, for a number of reasons. And um, this focus on the refugee-refugee relationality in the context of displacement and more than displacement is important because solely focusing on and providing aid to newly displaced people or people who have just experienced a crisis in, in the short term, as it were, can discriminate against those who are living in protracted situations of displacement whose vulnerability may increase over time. And this is one of the key challenges that I think that we face when policy and practice is often characterized by a, um, what we can call a presentist bias, that is only focusing on and responding to the new crisis situation, rather than thinking more carefully about intersecting and overlapping forms of precarity. So when we think about these overlapping precarities and the increasing vulnerability over time. Unfortunately, the situation in Lebanon um, demonstrates this uh, very clearly. So we can start by noting, of course, that displacement from Syria um, to uh, Lebanon um, may have started in 2011, but of course takes place on top of long-standing protracted displacements, both internally and internationally. When we then look at the events of uh, 2020, we see that these starkly illustrate in the case of Lebanon, the ways that vulnerabilities can be accentuated by intersecting crises, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has afflicted the country since March, and which has led to a range of xenophobic and discriminatory uh, responses, including discrim discriminatory curfews on refugees, politicians demanding camp closures, and falsely asserting that refugees were vectors of disease and of um, contagion, when in fact we know that COVID-19 arrived in Lebanon through Lebanese citizens' travel from Italy and Iran, but using this well-worn trope of refugees as vectors of disease to justify increased surveillance and control um, through these xenophobic and discriminatory policies. So on top of that, we then have the devastating explosion in Beirut's port on the 4th of August last year, which was believed to have been caused by an impounded cargo of ammonium nitrate stored for several years in a warehouse without proper safety precautions. And with major loss of life and significant injuries um, alongside the destruction to the port and of roads, this has made the emergency delivery of aid supplies both very important, but also increasingly difficult and international donors started to send aid, including medical supplies and equipment, to Lebanon via the smaller northern port of Tripoli, which we'll be turning to um, shortly. Um, at that point, so this is August last year, at this point, the Lebanese Red Cross headquarters announces that all of the group's hospital teams in the north of the country would be relocated to Beirut due to a, a shift in priorities, and they were needed to bolster medical capacity to assist both blast survivors and the dramatically increasing number of COVID-19 patients in the capital. So bearing that background in mind, um, it's now to the coronavirus pandemic that will turn shifting from Beirut, which has been the focus of so much attention, to a small and relatively under-researched urban refugee camp in North Lebanon called Badawi Camp. Now, Badawi Refugee Camp was established in the early 1950s, and it is here that residents have been supporting both, in, in inverted commas, old and new fellow refugees who share the camp amidst the multifaceted risks created by the pandemic and by the diverse responses to it, responses that include unequal allocation of and access to healthcare resources, um, um, in addition to anti-refugee political uh, rhetoric and um, policies. 
So there are many ways that we could introduce Badawi refugee camp, but here I'll um, draw on Yusuf Mustafa Kasmir's um, poem, Writing the Camp, which I think captures some of the, its key dynamics. So he writes, refugees ask other refugees, who are you, who are we to come to you and who are you to come to us? Nobody answers. Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis, Kurds share the camp, the same different camp, the camp of a camp. They have all come to reoriginate the beginning with their own hands and feet. And this reference to reoriginating the beginning with their own hands and feet is a, a very uh, important reminder that um, for many people who have experienced conflict and displacement, they are always already in the middle of displacement. They have to reoriginate the beginning because this is a recurring process. In the case of Badawi refugee camp, um, about 15,000 Palestinian refugees who had previously been living in Nahr al-Badid refugee camp in Lebanon were internally displaced to and subsequently hosted in Badawi following the destruction of Nahr al-Badid camp in 2007. This means that around 10,000 refugees from Nahr al-Badid are now part of the refugee community in Badawi camp who are hosting people who've been displaced from Syria and who are responding to the needs and the rights of the diverse residents of Badawi camp. So here we have internally displaced refugees hosted by refugees who are themselves hosting refugees. And this is a very important, again, reminder of the precarity of the situations that people live in, but also these intersecting processes of displacement and of hosting and of the multiple um, uh, crises, um, effectively, that people navigate in their everyday lives and in the lives of their families and those who live um, around them. Now, it was early in 2010, as the coronavirus um, started to uh, erupt in different, um, different spaces and in different guises, um, that the residents of Badawi camp themselves started to await with fear for the arrival of COVID-19, um, as uh, Kasmir writes in his poem, With a third eye, I see the catastrophe. So I'll, I'll read his lines here. As we wait for the disease in echoless rooms, doors locked up, shutters dusted, thrust to the heart. The disease that will sign a pact with our diseases. In patience, bereft of patience, we stand still behind our walls. Without seeing, we shall see the disease that will be. With a third eye, I see the catastrophe. And this fear has been borne out by the UN statistics, which in uh, February of this year documented that Palestinians' COVID-19 mortality rate is three times higher than the mortality rate for the country as a whole. But importantly, as we all know, this increased risk, uh, this increased mortality risk, is not because of displacement. It isn't inevitable. Instead, camp residents in Lebanon are acutely vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19 because of living in overcrowded urban camps with poor infrastructure. Um, many uh, residents are afflicted with pre-existing health conditions that have multiplied and worsened over time due to, amongst other things, the fragile UNRWA health systems, which have been defunded and weakened over decades by fickle donors, while Lebanese health systems have a long history of discriminating against and denying treatment to refugees. So against this backdrop, it's not surprising that mistrust amongst Palestinians and their fellow camp dwellers towards international and national aid agencies and government departments has remained very high as they have faced COVID-19. Which leads us to the question, well, how have the residents of Badawi refugee camp responded to this imminent catastrophe? Well, indeed, refugees in Lebanon, like other displaced and dispossessed people around the world, have drawn on long-standing traditions of mutual aid and of solidarity to seek and to enact ways to protect themselves and others from the pandemic. And I'll turn now briefly to some of those responses. So the first example that I'll, that I'll draw on um, is um, from March 2020. So this is um, more or less coinciding with um, politicians' declarations that camps are dangerous spaces and that camps should be closed off and that curfews should be imposed by the government and, and uh, enacted by um, Lebanese security forces, um, which did in fact take place um, across the country. 
But on the 22nd of March last year, the Dalby Camps Joint Security Forces Committee, in addition to the Popular Committee and the Mosques Committee, um, jointly announced that a curfew would be enforced on the camps' residents and businesses. And unlike previous curfews and camp, camp lockdowns, of which there have been many since the camp's establishment in the 1950s, this curfew wasn't imposed by Lebanese authorities asserting that the camps are sites of danger. Instead, because COVID-19 cases had been confirmed in a neighbouring area, Badawi camp activists in fact lobbied for the camp's entrances and exits to be closed in order to help protect camp residents. In Badawi, as in other displacement and hosting contexts, refugee camps are not isolated spaces, but instead are intimately connected to urban and non-urban areas beyond the boundaries of the camp. So although Palestinian camps have often been perceived as islands of insecurity, to use Rosemary Sayeh's term, in this context, many camp residents promptly identified the risks that existed outside of the camp and worked to encourage people to remain within their homes. So a second example of camp-based responses um, relates to information. So Onurwa had been perceived as being very slow to inform camp residents about the risks of COVID-19 um, and had also been perceived as being very slow to provide different forms of support. So members of the Palestinian um, Cultural Club in Badawi Camp, or the Badawi Camp Cultural Club as I'll refer to it now, they promptly took action, drawing on their intimate knowledge of camp life um, and of everyday needs and rights in the camp to um, adapt existing um, evidence-based informational posters, including World Health Organization materials, translating them into Arabic and sharing these posters and other forms of guidance in print and via social media to reach camp residents of all demographics in an accessible manner. In addition to running special programmes on its radio station, the Cultural Club worked with social media networks that had been established locally for years. These networks um, previously had been used to inform residents about everything from school closures to which areas of the camp should be avoided during armed clashes or sporadic shootings. Now, coronavirus at this stage had not entered the camp, but there was a very strong recognition that although it wasn't visible or audible in the way that these armed clashes and sporadic shootings had been in the past, that it was an equally significant existential threat um, to, to residents in the camp. So this sharing of information was, um, was very important from their perspective. By April, um, they also um, increasingly focused on food, which of course is an essential resource. And many camp residents have for a very long time in the camp tried to make sure that it's diverse, that the camp's diverse residents in receive enough food um, uh, at different junctures of, of their lives. And over the past few years, in preparation for the holy month of Ramadan, Palestinian residents, including members of the cultural club, have collected financial donations from other Palestinians to prepare iftar food baskets to break the fast um, during the month of Ramadan um, to be distributed to residents identified as especially in need, whatever their nationality. So Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Kurdish or Lebanese, and irrespective of their place of origin. In 2020, um, given the fears and the restrictions on movement which arose due to the pandemic, the organisers of these food baskets um, were concerned that it would not be safe for large numbers of people to go door to door collecting donations or to work together shopping for ingredients, cooking and subsequently distributing hot meals during Ramadan. Um, but nonetheless, the number of people um, in need of food has been much larger than in previous years, not just because of the pandemic, but also due to the ongoing collapse of the already fragile um, Lebanese economy. So the camp was able to receive donations sourced from, uh, from the camp itself and from the neighboring areas, um, started by distributing um, food boxes um, because of this concern that it wouldn't be safe to congregate and to prepare food and then distribute it together, but then realised um, increasingly that for the many people who would particularly benefit from receiving these food baskets, um, that they may not in fact have the resources to be able to cook the food. They might not have the, um, the, 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 um, the cooking equipment, they might not have uh, fridges, uh, access to electricity um, or um, cooking stoves, etc., to be able to cook this. So the decision was made to um, enact 
um, food preparation in a safe manner and to subsequently distribute food um, through um, respecting um, social distancing measures as, as far as possible. So they adapted to this um, changing situation and expanded a pre-existing um, uh, Ramadan basket um, initiative to ensure that the largest number of people in the camp were able to access these, these food baskets. But just a few days before the start of Ramadan, on April 23rd, um, as the limits of local resources became increasingly apparent, the Badawi Camp Cultural Club um, chapters, um, well, the, the chapter in Badawi, but also the Cultural Club chapter in Marilias Camp, joined an emergency relief uh, fundraiser in partnership with um, a centre in Bujr Barajna Camp, and also two US-based Palestinian initiatives, the Palestinian Youth Movement and the Palestine Right, right to Return Coalition. And their aim was to raise 50,000 US dollars to buy and distribute packages of food and sanitizing project, uh, products um, in order to help residents of those three camps, um, Badawi, Marilias, and Bujr Barajne, um, to be able to practice social distancing and offset some of the economic damage which had been caused by the pandemic. And um, within three months, this initiative had exceeded that goal. That international um, uh, collaboration was also supplemented with the Cultural Clubs Initiative, which was a who will donate a million fundraising drive, which was um, broad, uh, broadcast on their social media channels um, and on the internet. Now, of course, as I'm talking about this, it's an important, uh, it's very important to note that need and vulnerability do not simply arise because of displacement, but rather to remind ourselves that precarity is produced and is not inevitable. So vulnerability to shocks and crises will increase over time um, and increase due to different crises, including um, the um, spiraling um, crisis of Lebanon's financial system. So here we have some of the key dates which um, exist or coincide with the arrival of, of COVID-19 in, uh, in Lebanon with um, bank transfers and bank withdrawals being suspended in March 2020, um, the closure of Beirut airport and the devaluation of the Lebanese lira, um, all meaning that people were unable to access, um, access money if they had access to, uh, previously had access to bank accounts, they were unable to receive uh, remittances um, from uh, relatives and, and friends um, outside of Lebanon, and whatever money they did have access to um, was increasingly um, unable to purchase the goods which themselves were also limited in supply for different reasons. So here we see that the risk of people becoming destitute and starving is because of um, policies and political decisions, not just because of displacement, as it were. And ultimately, social distancing is impossible for people who live in overcrowded conditions, who have no savings to draw on to buy food, and whose survival is contingent on precarious daily labour in the informal sector. And indeed, in Lebanon, national authorities have long prohibited Palestinian and Syrian refugees from entering the formal uh, labour market. And that leaves them amongst the people least likely um, to be able to afford to practice social distancing, therefore putting them at higher risk of contracting the disease. So with this brief chronology that I'm going through, um, in fact, by uh, June 2020, there were these diverse camp-based um, activities and camp-led activities which had been taking place in Badawi camp. But at this point, no Palestinians in Lebanon had yet been confirmed as contracting or having contracted COVID. But unfortunately, on 21st of June last year, the state-run national news agency reported that municipal testing of Syrian refugees working in Tripoli's port had um, indicated that a number of Syrians who lived in Badawi camp and on the camp's outskirts had tested positive. And at this stage, um, UNRWA uh, representatives, um, in conjunction with these media declarations, um, indicated that um, the camp's confirmed cases marked a significant tipping point for the whole country. And uh, one UNRWA representative stated, the epidemic no longer just threatens our camps, it has now entered them. So at this stage, we witnessed um, discriminatory processes, including nationality-based testing um, systems. And these processes led to honored war officials um, implicitly asserting that the previously clean, in inverted, camps, uh, in inverted commas, camp was now at risk due to the Syrians' infections. 
So Syrian refugees were identified by the authorities and by the media as the vector of disease. And in turn, local actors in the camp, including um, Palestinian factions and the popular committee, um, announced that they had identified the location of the two Syrians living quarters within Badawi camp and marked them as the epicenter of contagion risk within the camp. At this time, um, contact tracing was immediately set in motion under the supervision of the camp's health committee and the Lebanese Ministry of Health, which had committed to transferring any individuals who tested positive to a state hospital. But as these developments unfolded, some camp residents started to associate COVID-19 with Syrians in line with the xenophobic rhetoric that had been used by Lebanese politicians at the onset of the pandemic. And amid the, raising, uh, the rising fear um, of the arrival of the virus, members of the popular and the security committees started um, roaming the alleyways and the streets of the camp, instructing people to shutter their shops and to stay indoors. And Badawi camp was once again subje uh, subjected to closure, um, a space and a community in quarantine. Again, this is a good point to, to step back and to remember that um, Local uh, responses developed in Badawi camp, including those funded locally and those supported through transnational networks, demonstrate the ways that camp residents have worked individually and collectively to find ways to care for Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Kurdish and Lebanese residents alike, therefore transcending a focus on nationality based identity markers. And yet, such modes of solidarity and of mutuality have been placed at risk precisely due to national and municipal interventions that align with policies and with political discourses that have constituted the refugee other as the threatening carrier of disease and risk. So in essence, tensions and hostility are produced, not inevitable. So the final example that I'll give now of refugee-led responses um, arises in the context of the aftermath of the devastating August 2020 blast in Beirut's port, which I referred to earlier. And this coincided with the coronavirus infection rates soaring across Lebanon and with medical infrastructure nationwide being under mounting pressure. So in autumn 2020, all of the Red Cross and Red Crescent hospitals in North Lebanon started to relocate with medical staff either being laid off or moving to Beirut in order to care for both blast survivors and for the rising number of COVID-19 patients in the capital. And although, although that focus on Beirut is very understandable given the vast destruction caused by the port explosion, allocating more resources to the capital has put people um, living elsewhere in the country at greater risk citizens and refugees alike. So recognizing the increasing pressure on medical infrastructure and the national uh, amidst this national emergency, and as infection rates and deaths started to increase in Badawi refugee camp, the Badawi camp cultural club approached local officials in the town of Badawi um, in August to ask if they could use one of the municipality's ambulances in order to take refugees with COVID symptoms to hospitals. And the municipality granted its approval, loaning the camp an ambulance that was not being used at that time. So a member of the Badawi Camp Cultural Club volunteered to collect people who had suspected COVID-19 infections from both Badawi Camp and also the neighbouring camp, Nahd al -Berid, and volunteered to transport them to hospitals in uh, Tripoli and in Halba, and in some cases to the Rafiq al-Hariri Hospital in Beirut, where the majority of COVID cases have been um, cared for. So this Palestinian refugee driver, um, if we want to, to use that term, uh, wears a hazmat suit and protective gear, which have been provided by the Red Cross and by the Red Crescent Society at the club's request. Masks have been bought from local supermarkets and from shops, um, both in the camp and from neighboring areas. And by borrowing this ambulance, the cultural club has been using what we would call, or what Yusuf and I called, a using the citizens' tools in order to assist other refugees. Now, in doing so, the, um, the camp's cultural club and its members have continued to improvise with the limited available resources to navigate entrenched inequ um, inequitable systems. 
Such makeshift measures, however, are not sustainable and they are no substitute for the healthcare resources that national and local um, governments should be allocating to the camps during this crisis to protect both their residents and the surrounding communities. So our interlocutors um, have consistently um, noted that they celebrate the extent to which local responses have been developed, but they also reassert that these are not sustainable and that in fact more pressure needs to be applied to ensure that the structural inequalities um, that prevent people from being able to enact their own decisions and to be able to protect their own lives, those structural barriers need to be challenged and that more equitable systems need to be developed to provide people with access to um, meaningful access to medical supplies, medical care, in addition to um, fair access to, to the labour market, for example. So these are structural issues that need to be focused on. So in conclusion, um, documenting or archiving, following um, Yusuf um, Kasmir's term, um, uh, these local responses is a vital means of stressing the ways that people who have been displaced themselves seek to fill the gaps and to redress inequalities that have been created and reproduced by national and international actors alike. And well before COVID-19 arrived in Lebanon, mutual aid initiatives in Badawi camp and of course elsewhere had transcended nationality-based identifiers to provide support to camp residents with wide ranging backgrounds, in turn highlighting the importance of critically examining the ways that pre-existing support systems and networks are being affected both by the virus itself and by the different policies and politics emerging in the context of the pandemic, including nationality-based testing and overlapping crises such as the Beirut blast. So ultimately, um, discourses and policies that demarcate the sanctity of the self through the denigration of the other heighten the dangers of politically produced precarity while undermining the potential for solidarity in times of overlapping precarities. However, individuals, communities and civil society groups continue finding and implementing those makeshift measures which aim to fill the gaps which have been created by national and international actors alike. And in essence, we cannot understand either the vulnerabilities that people face in displacement or the responses that they are developing without considering the ways that local experiences of and responses to um, displacement and other crises are framed by national and international systems, including long-standing structural inequalities and processes of marginalization and exclusion. So the vulnerabilities that the residents of Badawi camp Palestinians and Syrians alongside Iraqis, Kurds and Lebanese are facing are caused by political failures that have deep historical roots um, and whose repercussions will continue to be palpably felt in both the near and the distant future. So thank you again so much for listening and I'm very much looking forward to our conversations um, and our, um, our discussions. Um, I hope we've got enough time now for, for some exchange um, and I'd also like to um, encourage you to please join our communities of conversation both on the refugee hosts um, platform and on the southern responses to displacement platform um, both of whose contact details you can see on the slide um, here which we'll just leave up for a moment and then I will stop sharing the screen and come back to see all of you now. So thank you again so very much for, for listening. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, so I don't know if you have uh, questions, you are welcome to either put them on the chat or um, ask directly. Uh, so thank you very much for, for you know highlighting the structural constraints that exist on everybody's uh, responses. I was, I was really quite kind of interesting, interested in how the degree to which, for instance, young people lead the charge in, um, in changing the world. Um, so the example that you give of the driver, for instance, is that, you know, a younger driver that, that, that decides to, to, to move forward, for instance. Uh, have you had any kind of like a insight into any generational uh, engagement? If you don't mind me, I know it's an off the wall question, but I'm really kind of interested in how, um, you know, young people themselves um, just either step up or, or, or you know, how, how, 
yeah, how like maybe they they step they step step up to change the world or or refuse to do so, depending. Mm-hmm on the generation mm, absolutely thanks Catherine so in the case of the Badawi Camp Cultural Club it is a youth organization so it's an organization that caters for young people in the camp um, but a large number of the people who organize events etc are themselves Anadwa teachers or Anadwa staff who are dissatisfied with the extent to which Anadwa itself is able or willing to address particular gaps and therefore takes it um, as as a responsibility to to fill those gaps in different ways. Um, So here we have um, young people certainly being very active but also working in collaboration with Um, members of the the community who wouldn't traditionally be conceptualized as part of the younger generation let's say Um, so there are there are different age groups working together and there are also different initiatives taking place so here I focused in on on the on the cultural club but there are also different initiatives taking place um, including through uh, through the mosque which again would or through the many mosques in the camp which again would typically be an older generation Um, whereas through the camp um, cultural club we have um, women and men working together from different generations to identify what some of these gaps would be, whether it's information, food, financial resources, sanitation um, products, um, or stepping in to provide those medical um, medical resources or access to those medical resources. Um, I'm looking forward to delving a little bit more deeply into, um, into these questions um, as you know, with Alistair Ager and, and many other colleagues, we've been looking at local led responses to displacement over the course of four years. And unfortunately, COVID has hit us right at the end of the project, but it really draws out the extent to which members of, of the camp community of all ages, um, of all professions and of none, um, take different responsibilities and make different decisions on how to respond to these um, overlapping precarities. I haven't answered your question very clearly, but thank you. Sorry, I have a question, Eleanor. Thank you for your presentation. I'm um, speaking from Australia and I'm very familiar with the Asia Pacific kind of refugee led initiatives. I've been involved in in some of the more strategic advocacy work that um, refugee leaders have been involved in. And I'm wondering in your context, how much the local level responses are filtering up to sort of the national level decision making, is there any access um, by refugee led organisations to any of that sort of decision making beyond the camp, but but actually where the decisions are being made by Red Cross, for example, in the humanitarian coordination sort of system Um, and any comments you have about the, the politics of that, I guess, from your experience. So thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. This kind of comes back to Catherine's comment as well. You know, to what extent younger people want to change the world, or where where, where they see their forum and their sphere of action. So, for many different reasons, the cultural club doesn't have access and probably isn't really seeking access to governmental systems, for example. And as I mentioned, with quite a lot of honoured were staff actually being involved in the activities, it's almost identifying the failures in the in the system and saying, well, what can we do to fill the gaps that are not only left by the system, but often actually created by the systems themselves? So I think this comes back to that broader question of kind of a division of labour and a division of the gaps um, and where different people feel that they can fill those gaps, often on through horizontal cooperation. So one of the initiatives that I highlighted there, yes, has transnational support from US Palestinian initiatives, but is also working with other camp-based youth groups. So whether it's the Marilias um, Cultural Club um, or the Burjur Barajna Youth Centre, working together to identify what are the common struggles that we are facing across the camps and how can we work together with that transnational support to um, to support um, the, the, the residents of these camp situations. Um, of course, there are many other people who do want to um, have access to those systems and those structures of power and who will be applying for jobs um, and who will be lobbying um, NGOs and the organisations that they have access to. But the opportunities are certainly not coordinated and supported in the way that uh, refugee led organisations are increasingly having a platform in specific UN governmental and NGO initiatives um, 
but we, we go back to that question of who, whose voices are heard and how to what extent is it a strategic incorporation or actually a challenge to the status quo and really offering an alternative mode of operating which doesn't just perpetuate the humanitarian system um, itself so but I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the, the Asia Pacific um, um, kind of examples and how that does or doesn't challenge those, those systems themselves. And your work is really important in that, Louisa. Thank you. So, I'm so struck by the tension of this, the refugees who are showing that they are capable, that they are able to offer the solutions to problems, that they're not simply a social burden and yet not wanting to um, aggrandize themselves to the point where it's sort of like, and so, you know, there isn't still this existing incredible inequality. In other words, that, that that's a tension that I found in my own field work in Greece as well, where refugees are, are saying, yes, we are, we can do it, but also this is an impossible task. And, and I just, you started to sort of talk a little bit about that towards the end. And I just wanted to get more I don't know, ethnographic grounding and what your some of the specifics, if you could give us some so that I love the image that you had of the of the cords all wrapped around this stick and you just, you know, people are so creative and yet it's so fundamentally um, unfair and wrong the way resources are shared or hoarded. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and as you say, your research in, in Greece demonstrates this remarkably clearly. So this is a tension, I think, that arises in so much of our research where we we recognize of course, the agency that people have. And we, in my case, want to document the work that people are doing and they are resisting and they are archiving their own responses and they're doing the research and they're demonstrating their capabilities to conceptualize and to develop different systems, et cetera, et cetera, not just to survive and to stay alive. That's that's not the, the basis of, of their actions. And yet at the same time, this recognition that it's not sustainable. So if you think about um, the, the image that I had of, of people from Lahir Badid, you know, these are internally displaced refugees hosted by other refugees now hosting refugees. If we, if we recognize displacement as being part of this always already being in the middle of displacement, then it's thinking through, well, what are the political foundations for that crisis, those crises, the overlapping precarities, and how do we in fact need a deeply political response to this rather than the constant depoliticization of humanitarian crisis as if another plaster is going to really fix it. So I think that it goes back to what um, I think that Catherine was you know, identifying that I was stressing the structural, and I think that I am stressing the structural um, precisely because of that tension in my own research that I don't want to suggest that that the US or that the UN has the right to withdraw and to say, we don't have to be involved anymore. We don't have a responsibility because look, people are doing it themselves, which is effectively one of the tensions of the localization of aid agenda. It's saying, yes, local communities are doing this, municipalities can do this, but they need the relevant forms of support, not an abrogation of responsibility. So for me, it's that combination of documenting what archiving, what people are always already doing, but highlighting that this is not sustainable precisely because it's if it's not going to be COVID and it's not going to be the Beirut blast, it's going to be something else. And you can't expect people to continue carrying that without addressing those structural inequalities. I'm not giving you any ethnographic detail in that response, Zarina. Um, but I know that you you have done so much research in this in this area as well. And I think it's more, it's more that tension, you know, even what's the ethics? What are the ethics of even documenting what people are doing? How does that play into and potentially reproduce this system of abrogating responsibility when these are intrinsically political contexts? It, it's an unfair question because honestly, it's something I myself have not resolved in my own work of you know, not wanting to kind of idealize this incredible resistance, um, you know, without kind of that kind of hard hitting critique. And I think you do, I, I learn from you always, Elena, because you do it, I think, very effectively here and elsewhere, where you really do manage to keep us thinking about both scales. That's really kind of you, Zarina. Thank you. Can I just jump in there? And I think, I, I mean, I'm really loving this conversation, but I think that's maybe what I was interested in terms of that structural, because I, I agree completely with what, and, and I recognise in, in the organisations that I work with here in, in the Asia Pacific, the same, the same themes and the same frustrations and the same sort of you wanting to highlight what they do, because it's in some ways it's 
breathtaking, like creative and wonderful. But other times it's so frustrating to think that how much work is and how much really hard work is, is done to try and even get meagre things happening. So my question is really how do we change the systems as well as recognise the strengths? And I think that um, how the strategically um, and not in, and I think you're right, Eleanor, in terms of like is it really representation and what does it look like and who's speaking and all those sorts of things which are very complicated um, and is it actually shifting anything? But that's my real question is how do we take what is done at a local level and also change systems and recognise that we don't want to shift responsibility but bring people into that picture. So anyway. Thank you, Louise. And absolutely. I, I don't think that I have the solution, certainly, but I'm also not sure that I should have the solution. That's exactly the point, is that it shouldn't be me in Oxford in the UK saying this is what the UN should do, but rather actually, well, how do we listen? How do we actually stop and listen and deconstruct and actually start a, a, an open an equitable conversation around this with the people who are not just affected communities. They are always and already responding. And the humanitarian system often undermines those responses, but won't accept that because it's also part of the survival of the system, which has at its core, the foundation or the aim of, of improving people's lives. Um, but I think that, that that's the ongoing work. It's how to open up those equitable conversations in a way that is, is willing to, to, to challenge the systems. Um, and we can go around in circles on it, but I'm, I'm not the right person to answer it. Um, and, but neither is necessarily one person from Badawi refugee camp. It's how we actually join up those dots and how we have perhaps those examples of horizontal conversations and seeing what works and um, what works to destabilize as well as what works to, to construct. I think Paul had a question. Somewhere. Yes. Uh, hi, Elena. Thank you for the presentation. I joined late. Uh, I couldn't actually connect. I'm in Lebanon now. And actually, I uh, we went through, me and my family, through the uh, Beirut blast. Um, However, you know, I, I don't want to go there because that's a, that's a, that would be a long discussion. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently finalizing my PhD at uh, UCL. I'm a, I'm a UCL Yale scholar. And my ethnographic studies and my investigation is about Syrian refugees. So uh, I know that they're very marginalized. I know that uh, through some findings that some bottom-up approaches uh, were successful in a way, even if temporary, to, let's say, strengthen the ties between host community members and senior refugees. However, when I visited, and I actually have a paper about that, and I did some ethnographic studies on the Bayi camp, where you have Palestinian and then senior refugees, where um, recently, I mean, they recently joined after the crisis. Uh, the camp is, is, is there over 50 years. And the same thing for Anil Helwi. Uh, I saw and I noticed uh, through the interviews that senior refugees over there are even marginalized by Palestinian refugees. So there is like uh, um, refugees to refugees marginalization, which actually uh, was an interesting finding. So the question is, because you know, you're an expert in that, uh, I'm, I'm more investigating the senior refugees. So the question is, have you found or noticed any bottom-up approaches or any mechanisms between Palestinian and, and, and Syrian refugees within those camps to strengthen the, or let's say lessen the marginaliz marginalization between the two parties. For example, this, this, this club that you just mentioned, does it include Syrian refugees? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, I wish that UCL were open so that we could meet and have the conversation um, there. But um, thank you for thank you for your question. Um, so absolutely, I, as as Zarina was saying, in my research, I don't mean to idealize responses from Badawi refugee camp or any of the 
the other places where I, where I um, speak with people and, and listen to, to what they're saying, um, but rather to explore those complex relationships and what it means to actually focus on the relationship between Palestinians and Syrians or Palestinians and Kurds, Palestinians and Iraqis and the multiple directionalities of, of displacement and hosting that exist in these situations. Um, and certainly in my broader research, I, I do document and explore different instances of marginalization, of discrimination and of exclusion. So that's certainly part and parcel of, of those processes. There are many different initiatives that do recognize that and explicitly attempt to promote social cohesion in that lovely NGO language, um, but also go beyond that and think through, well, we're all residents of this space. And if we take the neighborhood or the camp as the core, then it's everybody who's in this space who is a member of this organization or who is in, involved in this particular initiative. Um, and there, there are many, many different local responses which embody that um, and which attempt to challenge um, the discrimination. As I was suggesting in, in my presentation today, discrimination, hostility, tension isn't inevitable. It's often produced politically. So the example that I was giving from Baderi refugee camp was of, um, I'm not sure at what stage you joined, but nationality-based testing in Tripoli port of Syrian refugees, identified Syrian refugees who lived in Badawi camp as carrying COVID-19 and of bringing it into the camp and of polluting the previously safe camp. So here it's nationality-based testing, media reporting, political um, declarations, which leads to the suspicion of, of Syrians as the epicenter um, and as, as the bearers of, of the disease. So if we recognize that tensions, hostility, et cetera, are produced rather than inevitable, then that's precisely how it can be challenged and it can be deconstructed. And again, Zarina's work in, in, in Greece demonstrates the same, that you have strange alliances or what seem to be strange alliances, and Zarina can speak to this herself, um, uh, across political and ideological lines from atheist and secular to, to faith-based um, responses, et cetera. Um, so there definitely is marginalization. There definitely is discrimination, just as there is between different groups of Palestinians. There's discrimination between Palestinians who were born in Badawi camp and Palestinians who've come from Yarmouk. And you can identify where if it's a Palestinian from Syria or a Palestinian from Lebanon. And there are multiple forms of exclusion and marginalization. For me, it's recognizing that it's not inevitable and that there are multiple ways of addressing it, but it does come back, I think, to the political on so many different levels. Um, and I think it would be great, Zarina, would you like to come in on that? Because this is you know, at the core of so much of your research as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love this point. And, and you know, it seems like such a simple point to say that, that these uh, conflicts are produced and not natural. And yet, when we look at the way that the NGOs think and the way the governments think, they absolutely treat these conflicts between refugees as spontaneous and natural eruptions in the camps rather than things that are absolutely produced by structures. And so I think as scholars, sometimes, I mean, I certainly have the feeling where I'm just like, this is such a banal point. Should I keep making this point? And then I hear Elena make it so powerfully again. And I say, oh my God, yes, because people don't get this point. They think that, you know, uh, I mean, in the camp that I was working in in Greece, it was that the strollers go to the Kurds before they go to the Afghanis, before they go to somebody else. And, and then, it, oh, well, why that? And well, my, you know, I'm, I had a baby and I needed a stroller now. And what, who, who decides that? Why can't it just simply be, you know, whoever needs a stroller gets a stroller, right? What, what does this invocation of nationality do? And I think, I mean, with the COVID, it's so powerful to think of the ways in which they're both though you know. thank you Zadina. i don't know if we got cut off there just at the end <laughs> but thank you paul what what do you what what do you think of that response or those responses i mean uh the i mean it was obvious that the ngos are exacerbating the the whole tension within the camp and within the host community members and but you know i was just curious to see what what mechanism could have been done to alleviate that between Palestinian and Syrian refugees or other refugees within the camps? Because I didn't notice that much of bottom-up approaches or top-down approaches in that that were successful. Uh, however, actually, based on, on, on also my research uh, regarding COVID-19, 
Syrian refugees were actually uh, marginalized. I'm talking about the Bekaa area. This is where my research is. Uh, they were, uh, they were, you know, afraid from the host community members to be stigmatized and all that. And then actually no cases were, were no cases were reported. So it was the, it was the opposite way. And they, they, they worked very well with the municipality. Uh, they were able to, uh, coordinate very well. I mean, the Shawish or, I mean, they were able to find, you know, to, to, to found those, uh, internal structural organization that communicate with authorities. So it was very successful, uh, I mean, till now. Yeah, and now we have more cases, it's, it's, it's uh, nationwide. Uh, but, but I didn't see yet any successful, uh, let's say mechanisms that, that brought the social cohesion or social integration. Yeah, I think it also comes back to that question of when you have to step in to alleviate something. I think what Zelina and I are suggesting is that it's actually useful to go back and to think about how and why was this produced to begin with, rather than assuming that there is a problem that needs to be fixed by an external intervention. And so I think that's that's one response or one thought process that I have in relation to, to what you're just saying there. And then I'm just gonna bring up a slide from another presentation that I have here and in terms of that notion of success and what mechanisms might be successful. So Zarina has seen this from um, a presentation that I gave at Yale a year, a year, two years ago now. So this notion of what is visible and what is undisclosed. So a lot of our initiatives, uh, sorry, a lot of the initiatives that we've been documenting are, are kind of below the radar to a certain extent. So here, what I call the poetics of undisclosed care documented through these three interview extracts. So we collected clothes, we offered food and cash to refugees, but I hope you don't mention this except for reasons related to your research because we do this only for God's sake. So that's a resident of Badawi camp from Nahal Berded. Um, a Syrian refugee living in Badawi camp. Those people who offer assistance without disclosing their names deserve respect. And a Kurdish refugee from Syria living in Badawi camp. Be like the good fruit that gives, sorry, be like the good tree that gives its fruits and does not ask who took them. So how do we think about what is successful, what is visible, what is invisible in these um, contexts? And there's definitely differentiated care. Here's another, another quote here. The differential response to residents of Nahr al camp being displaced to, to Badawi camp, as opposed to those um, displaced from Syria, something that's very well documented and kind of discussed within the camp. Um, again, another example of differentiated care. And then what I'm looking for here is what we can think of as that notion of success which is coming back to that question that you have. So here is a, a Syrian who's living in Badawi camp. And they say, the local communities here in Badawi camp are also in a deplorable situation and also suffer from poverty. They cannot meet their own needs. How can they provide in-kind and financial assistance to others? We only ask them for good treatment and non-discrimination between refugees on the basis of their political affiliations, which was something that had been happening in Badawi camp at that time. The institutions here are meant to provide assistance and we would like them to provide assistance in a professional professional manner. So this idea of, you know, what, what is considered to be um, enough, another um, interview with another Syrian in Badawi camp, um, about which is kind of picking up on this notion of caring or observing. I think that the biggest part of the local community does not care about this and their role does not transgress the limits of observing. So the question that arises for me is who determines what is enough and what is a good response or a, a, not, a not good enough response. So if we bear in mind the poetics of undisclosed care on the one hand, what is the necessity of care versus observing, for example? Is it enough to observe? Um, this Kurdish refugee from Syria says, it is enough that they allowed us to live amongst them despite this great population pressure. In my view, the local community is not interested in providing us with assistance. All they have to do is accept our presence in these areas and to offer us moral support. For me, it is enough that my Palestinian neighbor greets me every morning and that I go to work being sure that my children are well amongst their foreign neighbors. So it's not a response, but it's a question. Who decides what is enough? Who decides if it's material support, if it's spiritual support, if it's greeting somebody in the alleyway, sharing that space, ensuring that the children are well amongst their foreign neighbors? Is being with or being together enough from whose perspective? And how do we counteract that 
when we think about how NGOs come in and say that what we need is social cohesion and what we need is this kind of response. This is what success looks like. Well, actually, what does it look like from conditions of structural precarity? What does it look like from, from the, the perspective um, of different people within the camps? And that's not to say that, that I agree that that's enough. You know, I might have an idealized vision of, of what would work better. Um, but it's a more complex process, I think, than identifying this is the right mechanism, this is success, success according to whom, success according to what markers of visibility and action. I think they're some of the questions that I have as I'm continuing to go, you know, to, to read through the interview transcripts that we have and, and bearing in mind the ethnographic research that, that myself and my teams have been doing as well. So it'll be really fascinating to hear more about your research as it, as it continues to develop. Um, so thanks for, for that question, that conversation, and it's really lovely to be able to have that discussion and that exchange. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have a question, Elena, it's like um, what have been like the implication of what you have seen in terms of gender differences, basically, uh, some of the marginalization of women that you have seen before, how uh, that has changed now, or, um, or I mean, what directions uh, uh, with the pandemic. And uh, the um, other thing is about now um, in terms of the vaccinations, because I, I guess that even I, I guess in, in every country we are seeing now sort of some groups being put like at the end of the queue. So how uh, you have seen that basically um, from uh, the a country that is most likely stretched in terms of uh, vaccinating its own citizen, how well the xenophobic views are probably reinforced there um, in term, um, with, with the vaccination now of the COVID. Okay, thank you, Teresa. So I haven't looked specifically at gender dynamics with reference to COVID. Um, I, I've, I haven't been able to be in Badawi camp obviously for a long time. Um, so it's a kind of, it's all from a distance. Certainly there are longstanding um, unequal um, roles played by women with reference to the destruction of particular key services in a, in a space like Badawi. So if we think about school closures, so women are actively involved in educating their children and supporting their learning with, you know, often multiple children of different ages attempting to access online learning through, you know, uh, the one mobile phone or the, the radio system that, that might possibly be giving them access. So their domestic burdens are increasing, their educational um, provision, um, attempting to, to keep people safe and clean. So um, all of those duties are enhanced precisely because of, of the pandemic. Um, the ability to, to make do with um, very small amounts of food available, um, how you change your entire domestic framework around um, cooking and, and keeping your family safe and healthy and fed, etc. They're all key issues. Um, large numbers of, of women who are um, formal educators as well and therefore are teaching just as many of us are, you know, teaching plus looking after our families at home, etc. Um, and the impact of the reduction of informal labour opportunities, obviously um, leaving men in particularly vulnerable positions to exploitation as well, which has certainly been documented in, in many instances. So Syrian refugees, for example, who were already male refugees who are already at risk of detention, deportation, expulsion, etc., cetera, um, are even more at risk now precisely because of curfews, because of lockdowns, um, because of those people who are, don't have the privilege of remaining indoors um, and um, being, um, you know, respecting social distancing rules, being more visible in the public sphere and therefore more at risk. So I think there are different, different ways in which gender uh, relations have been affected and particular gendered vulnerabilities have been um, accentuated by, by COVID-19. Um, with reference to vaccinations in Lebanon, and I'm sure that Paul will be able to give us a kind of more up-to-date um, briefing from, from Beirut perspective, um, I think a lot of us were very concerned that 
Palestinians and Syrians would be excluded from the vaccination rollout. But in fact, shortly after the Lebanese politicians were first vaccinated in the country, um, vaccines were reaching um, UNHCR and UNRWA distribution points. So um, Palestinian refugees have and, and Syrian refugees have been able to register for vaccinations. There has been quite a bit of reti reticence amongst Lebanese citizens. So although there has been a push to, to um, vaccinate Lebanese um, citizens, the uptake potentially hasn't been as high as many would have expected. And there has been um, a, a, a particular buyout system to ensure that UN systems were able to purchase um, and distribute those vaccines. So thankfully, um, there has been a recognition that the public health crisis requires vaccination of all. And this is not immediately materialized as discrimination against um, pa Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Kurdish refugees accessing the vaccine. So there is a rollout. We'll have to see how that how that continues. Um, but in, in this case, a relatively small, so of course the per capita ratio of refugees per, per citizen capita is very high in Lebanon, but the overall population is, is relatively small when compared with many other countries. So the capacity to actually roll out is hopefully um, going to be, um, well, we can only hope that it's going to, going to work um, in, in a broadly equitable framework. Um, so maybe we'll have a better idea of that in, in, in a couple of weeks. We're, what are we, three, four weeks post the arrival of the vaccine in Lebanon? So it is, it is quite early days. Um, I'm not sure if, Paul, if you have a, a, a more up-to-date um, account of that. I mean, uh, the only update is like, you know, the whole uh, uh, rollout of the vaccine is a, has been a flop by the Lebanese government. However, it is, uh, everybody is equated. So it is open for everybody, which, which is actually a good sign. But we as Lebanese citizens now, we feel uh, ourselves as refugees as well uh, within the system. So, I mean, when you see that the deputies of your country just got vaccinated, uh, you know, I went through the official platform and everybody is waiting. So the amount of vaccines that arrived here is not enough. It's it's very low. Uh, but yes, uh, the, the good thing that you know everybody, uh, not only not only through vaccinations, actually everybody can be admitted to hospitals if needed. The Haredi State Hospital, uh, whether you're Lebanese, Syrian, or Palestinian. Uh, but the vaccination till now, it's 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 um, it, it is a flop, and it is within the corrupt system of the government. Do we have any more questions or comments or points of conversation? Um, I think probably I would like to uh, just mention, uh, I mean, uh, with respect to the vaccination in a completely different setting in Latin America with the Venezuelan refugees, uh, that actually the, because, um, non-registered Venezuelans do not have access to the, for example, the Colombian uh, healthcare system, the need to vaccinate them um, just brought um, basically a legalization uh, program now of around 1 million people, um, of a million refugees. So just, I mean, uh, at least in terms of the offer, and even if the supply is low for for everybody, because the vaccination uh, program is just started as well as in Lebanon. So at least, and and that was completely political. Well, not completely political decision because f the first reaction was not to vaccinate the refugees, but there was like an outcry, and then that brought the the change. So. Um, I guess probably in that respect is uh, sort of reassuring seeing that uh, um, uh, that behavior, but uh, maybe as you say, maybe working, I mean, see what is the uptake as well, because uh, even, I mean, in all the countries we have seen also, from minorities in general, so of a bit of a low take up of the vaccine. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the extent to which, for example, in the UK, there are grave concerns that with the hostile environment um, pervading medical settings, that people who have irregular status will will not risk, they, they won't risk having prenatal or birthing assistance. Um, they won't um, attend for vaccinations for their infants, um, let alone will they expose themselves potentially to detention and deportation um, on the basis of, of accessing um, COVID uh, vaccine, uh, vaccines. So absolutely, the, the hostile environment, the, the criminalisation of, of people with different legal backgrounds creates again creates these inequalities and creates these um these public health issues um so we can we can only hope there are increasing countries which are ensuring that there is access um vaccination access for for people with with refugee backgrounds um but i was seeing um and yvonne might might speak to this um in canada for example the adverts that are being circulated Catherine Clark Kazak has been discussing this on Twitter, refers to all Canadians are eligible for the vaccine, which excludes people who aren't necessarily citizens. So even how the terminology is used, who is included or excluded, when in fact migrants and refugees are eligible for the vaccine, but the terminology that is being used is exclusion, it is excluding people. Um, and as I said, I don't know if Yvonne um, has any um, comments from her own research as well, um, or from her reflections on, on the situation in, in Canada. Hi, yes. Thanks, Elena, for uh, speaking about that. Um, yes, there's uh, been some discussion of that. And then I think in general, there's a, there's a lot of discourse by the Prime Minister of um, Canada, Justin Trudeau, about this narrative of we're all in this together, which has upset um, a lot of people. Um, because, of course, we understand that um, we're not all in this together. There's a lot of uh, inequalities uh, that exist. So this type of discourse um, has been upsetting people because it's been taking place also at all different levels um, of the government as well. In general, a lot of vaccine confusion. Everybody is it, it, all over the news. Everybody is quite upset about how it's getting rolled out, what systems are being used. People are trying to line up and... Uh, uh, and that's that's of no help because they're supposed to make phone calls. You make phone calls and um, you can't get through because everybody is also on the line trying to sort it out. So, it, yeah, Canada is not a great example. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Yvonne. Again, kind of disrupting the assumptions that erupted so early on in the COVID pandemic that certain countries would be well prepared, and the red you know the red zones of where there would be greater crises hasn't necessarily corresponded with that geopolitics of the imagination of, of health and infirmity. Okay, um, so as I think uh, we reach uh, the end of this conversation. So thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Elena. And um, yes, if I guess uh, we like um to uh yeah just um to uh, uh contact you i mean on this topic uh or yeah and also basically sort of expand the community of uh, people researching so thank you very much thank you Teresa. thank you all for for joining and for staying on thank you lovely Bye. lovely to see you all thank you